tonight's speaker is Kevin Coyne. Kevin has been such a wonderful supporter and resource for MCHA, so we're all really big fans here. He's a journalist and an adjunct professor at Columbia Journalism School. He's authored several books, including Marching Home to War and Back with the Men of One American Town, about six World War II veterans from Freehold. He served on the Freehold Borough Council, where he helped establish the town's Historic Preservation Commission, and has been Freehold Borough's town historian for over 20 years. He's lived here his entire life, and a little known fact about Kevin is that he's also a big fan of the Freehold-based rock band Audition, and he hasn't missed a performance yet, so I feel that bears mentioning as well. So without further ado, please welcome Kevin Coyne. Uh, thank you, Dana. Uh, Audition is my brother-in-law's band from high school and Dana's husband band, so uh, that's what that shout out is for. And I clearly need a new picture. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a very generous old picture. So it's a great picture. Uh, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna get you away from me, so you don't have to look at me. And can you hear me? Okay, is the, the level okay? You're perfect. Okay, all right. So the idea here is um, when they asked me to do something, I want to do something a little different uh, to try to uh, expand the story a little bit. And I'm gonna share my screen here. And it's a minimalist slideshow, but it, it is more diverting than looking at me. And let me just do that quickly. Okay, so I'm gonna start with Tip O'Neill, who said famously, all politics is local. Uh, well, of course, uh, all history is local too. And the reason we're all here, the re you're, you're all members of the, of, well, you're either members of the groups or you're, you're interested in local history is because we, we're interested in who lived here before us, who who did who did things before us, who built things before us. We want to know all the small local roads where they lead. Um, but what's always interested me is how they connect to the larger ones, and and that's actually the whole idea behind the uh, exhibit that's at the MCHA now, the His Hometown exhibit, uh, because that's something that has interested Bruce Springsteen as well, is how big can you get from a small place? I don't mean in terms of fame, I mean in terms of the story, the stories you tell. And that's what he has always done, is connected the large to the small to make uh, the stories that he grew up with and have lived with here into universal stories that speak to uh, the world. And that's, if you go to the exhibit, if you haven't, um, you need to uh, before it goes. It, and you'll see, you know, the first floor of that exhibit is the uh, is his musical career, but the second floor is the larger the larger story of where it all came from. But this isn't just about Bruce here. That's a small portion of tonight, um, because I am the, I'm the borough historian. Which just to be clear, because people do sometimes assume that's a paid position and ask me to do things, uh, and I do them for them, but I make clear that it is entirely a volunteer position, although it is appointed annually by the mayor and I take the oath uh, every year. It is a volunteer position. And my, uh, let me see, uh, no, let, let me go back to that. That's a map in New Jersey. Freehold, um, I don't know if you can see my thing here. My Freehold was once um, one of three townships in what was Monmouth and Ocean County, all the way, Monmouth and Ocean, Monmouth County was all Monmouth and Ocean County. There were only three townships. There was Freehold over here. There was Shrews, um, uh, Middletown up here and Shrewsbury along here. And uh, my family, um, like part of Bruce's family, they were, they were potato famine migrants. They came here in the 1850s on my father's side. Uh, on my mother's side, they came here to work in the mill, the rug mill, from Slovakia in the 1920s. So it's a real classic mixed freehold uh, family. Um, and so when I grew up here in freehold, the biggest thing, it, I grew up here, I was born in 1959, which makes me 62 years old, which makes me still younger than my predecessor. We'll show you a picture of him in a minute and tell you how old he was when he died, which I hope is uh, uh, prophetic. Um, the biggest thing here was the biggest thing we were always talking about was that the reason Freehold was famous wasn't because of Bruce Springsteen, because he wasn't famous yet. It was because of the Battle of Mammoth. Uh, and as a town historian, uh, my job, my volunteer job is twofold. It's, well, it's, well, it's threefold. It's the answer. Like for, for instance, today I was helping the Federici family decide 
figure out when they first sold pizzas, which I found the first ad for, it was in 1947. They started making tomato pies in 1947. But mostly um, the fourth graders get to hear about the Battle of Mammoth and visiting Scandinavian and Southern European journalists come to hear about Bruce Springsteen. And the, um, so there are a few things here that are, you know, historically significant. There's the Covenhoven House belonging to the MCHA, General Clinton's headquarters during the Battle of Monmouth. There's St. Peter's Church, which was used as a hospital during the, during the battle. There are two of only three structures that were here during the war. Uh, there's Old Tenant Church, which was also used during, during the battle. And, um, but what I was interested in, I'm interested less in structures than in, than in people. And so what I did for this is I came up with three people, three centuries, three, three men. I'm sorry, they're all men, but that's the way it worked. Three men, three centuries, three big stories. And so when I was learning about the Battle of Mammoth, this is something either, oh, that's the Springsteen thing. I, I should have showed you that sooner. Oh, well, that's Ira. Ira. Ira Tilton was 98 when he died. God bless him. And I spent a fair amount of time with him before he died, driving around town, pricking his brain. And he was a lovely old man. He got a little crotchety uh, in his old age. Um, people would call him up and, you know, because he was a free old story and wondering about Bruce Springsteen. He'd say, I don't know anything about Bruce Springsteen. Hang up the phone. But he knew everything about everything else. Uh, and this is how far back, this, this is the genealogy. When Ira Tilton was driving me around, or actually I, I drove, I didn't let him drive too often. Um, his father, this is what his father's job was. His father's job was selling windmills to farmers. That's how, that's, think about that. Think about how long ago that was. Uh, so anyway, I took over from, from, from Ira in 2000 after he died at the age of 98. Uh, but this, I don't, you can't really see this up here. This, I just, I was just there for the first time recently at Valley Forge. And this is an important lesson to me. Um, this is with the Washington Arch at Valley Forge. And I kind of knew, you know, as a kid, they just tell you, they just tell you about the Battle of Mammoth in, as, as, a, as a single day, you know, June 28th, 1778, big battle, only time to commanding generals, maybe the largest land battle of the revolution. But where did it fit? And, you know, when you're a fourth grader, that doesn't really, that's not really part of your questioning, but uh, it was really only until somebody said Valley Forge Battle of Mammoth that I really understood it. And so I was just there a few weeks ago uh, for the first time. My son and a friend and I, we rode our bikes from Philadelphia out the trail there. And look at this sign. If you can read this, Officers and Private Soldiers of the Continental Army, December 19th, 1777 to June 19th, 1778. And I stood there and I was just, I, that was amazing to me because, you know, I knew that, but actually see that date carved in stone because the Battle of Monmouth was June 28th, 1778. So this is where they were. They got up from here on the morning of June 19th, 1778 and started marching toward Freehold. Uh, and that's, that's really the kind of connections that I'm interested in is how our small place can connect to the, the larger world. And so the first guy I wanna talk about is Nathaniel Scudder. Now, uh, when I was, this is after I was a councilman, I think, um, I ran, I mean, I'd run across him occasionally before, but I had never really knew exactly what he did. I have no, there is no image of Nathaniel Scudder, which is kind of why he's lost to his, not, he's not lost to history, but he's not familiar the way that um, other people whose images we have are. Uh, so Nathan, I got fascinated by Nathaniel Scudder and Mayor Higgins, I don't know if he's on here tonight, um, uh, who was mayor at the time, was, was fascinated by him as well. Uh, and actually uh, the council chambers in Borough Hall were remodeled and have this nice um, map of the Battle of Mammoth and, and a copy of the Articles of Confederation, which he signed. It's called Scudder Hall now. We had a dedication of it and we had a Scudder relative uh, come. So Nathaniel Scudder was born in, in 18, 1733 in Freehold. Uh, and he went to the College of New Jersey, which is Prince, became Princeton University in 17, graduated from there in 1751 and was a physician. Now, physicians back there didn't go to medical school or in resident training. They just sort of gave you a saw and some leeches and sent you out. But he was, a, he was um, uh, uh, Michael Atterberg's great book about the American Revolution of the County estimated there were maybe 20 men 
out of about 15,000 residents of Monmouth County at the time who had a college education, and Scudder was one of them. And so Scudder lived in this house, uh, which is roughly where Rita's ice cream is, uh, on the corner of West Main Street and Throckmorton Street. This was the Scudder house. And this is what we have. We don't have a picture of him. If we had a picture of him, I think we'd be naming things after him. This is another view of the house from the other side. And we even have an interior, we even have an interior of the house, but no picture of uh, poor Nathaniel. So Nathaniel was a, um, uh, just, well, if, if you read Michael Adelberg's book or, or read much, um, or even uh, Gary Stone and Mark Lender's book about the Battle of Monmouth, two remarkable resources, uh, you know that this was, a, Monmouth County was essentially a state of civil war during the, during the revolution. It was not an easy story of you know, patriots rising against the the, the British. Uh, it was a, it was a very very split. Freehold, which was called Monmouth Courthouse at the time, was predominantly uh, patriot. They were called Whigs, uh, patriot. But I'm going to use patriot because that's a more familiar term, uh, I think, to to you. And they were the the but the but the British. Well, first they were in Philadelphia, then they were in New York, and the British loyalists were concentrated along. The shore along Middletown. They they held Sandy Hook. The Navy was in Sandy Hook, uh, and they um, uh, and also there were these pine robbers down in the south. So they were sort of loyalist Tories, pine robbers all around us uh, here in in Freehold, and there was constant skirmishing, constant fighting. So um, Scudder gets very involved in this very early on. Uh, he was at one of the earliest Patriot meetings in 1774, the Committees of Safety. He's on the state militia. Uh, in 1776, he's elected to the, he, he's, I don't know if he's elected or appointed, it wasn't really clear to me, to the Legislative Council. This is after the Declar after we've proclaimed ourselves a nation, um, to the Legislative Council, which was in effect the, um, uh, the state Senate. Uh, the state senate of, of of New Jersey. There's one from each county, and then he was uh, in the Second Continental Congress. Um, so he served in Congress. This is he did not. He was not a signer of the Declaration because it was after the Declaration was signed. He was in Second Continental Congress from here. Let me see what else we have here. So it's a house inside the house. Oh, this is one of his descendants who was a Monmouth County resident, Richard Scudder, who died at the age of 99 in 2012. Direct descendant, also a Princeton graduate, publisher of the Newark Evening News. Uh, and also a partner in uh, uh, owner of Media uh, Media General, the whole the big newspaper chain on the Denver Post. Richard Scudder died in 2012. Um, so when when Scudder lived here, when, when not that Scudder, when Nathaniel Scudder lived here, Freehold was just a village. This was the courthouse. Uh, 1715, it was established. Uh, he went to Princeton. Uh, he was there. He was not. I, he was he was so early in Princeton. Nassau Hall hadn't been built yet. Uh, Nassau was built in like 1755. He was there in 1751. So that's the earliest image I could find of Princeton. So 1778, he signs the Articles of Confederation, all right, which is the you know the, the interim uh, governmental system before the before the um, uh, Constitution. Uh, he was in Philadelphia. Uh, this is this is this is an image I found of the debate of the Articles of um, uh, Articles of Confederation. All right, so uh, let's fast forward to the well, let me go back to that. Let me leave it on that for a moment. So, so here he is. All right, let, let's do. Let's do the Battle of Monmouth, then we'll talk about the Retaliators. All right. So, so the Battle of Monmouth. All right. So June nineteenth, they get up from from um, Valley Forge. They start walking toward toward uh, Freehold. Meanwhile, the whole British Army is walking across um, New Jersey to get to Sandy Hook, so they can. So we don't need that up there. So with the, so they can go uh, to New York. All right. So on the uh, night. Before the day before the battle, according to one account, uh, Scudder was the uh, colonel in the Mammoth Militia, the first brigade of the Mammoth Militia, I believe it was. And he, uh, before the battle, he uh, is summoned. He's ready to fight, and the Thompson House on the west end of town—I don't know precisely it was—to deliver a baby. So he has to deliver this baby on the morning of the battle, uh, and he watches. You know, Lee's Lee's troops come up and they start they start uh, uh, the fight right around where Freehold High School is now, and then the whole British Army turns on them and then they go back and they regroup where Veterans Park is now. They fight there. Scudder, according to this account, watches this happen after delivering the baby and then sneaks out through a trap door and joins his brigade and fights through the day. And you know, it's only a one day battle. Um, you know, hundreds of casualties on each side. 
exactly how many isn't entirely clear, but a, a, a significant number. Uh, and then as we know what happens, the, the they stop for the night and uh, um, Washington is over there at Tenet Church, around Tenet Church. And Scudder is one of the local guys, local uh, militia leaders who tells him, there you can't get him at Sandy Hook. You gotta, you gotta let him go. Which I think, from what I, I mean, Washington was inclined to do that anyway. He just wanted to sort of harass him along the way. Um, you know, it was an important battle. We can argue, we can have a whole other series of of uh, discussions about the significance of the Battle of Monmouth, and I'll leave it at that. But I just that was that was Scudder's role in that. He did he did fight there. But then what happened after the war is that he got kind of disillusioned with with the with the militia and decided because there was there were there were different factions among the uh, uh, patriots here in the in um, in Mammoth and this is what I mean about the small teaching the large and make it you know making the simple complex you know because it wasn't uh it, as I said it wasn't a black and white thing um and he was part of the committee of retaliation the Mammoth committee of retaliation which was led by uh general David Foreman uh oh that's the battle there's the battle that's the famous painting that's the MCHA this is general David Foreman who was a really uh, I don't want, violent guy. Uh, and he and Scudder were allies in this committee of retaliations. And they, their whole philosophy after the, after the, after their, and their whole military strategy after the battle was loyalists, dissenters, we're after you. We're going to attack you. We're going to take your stuff. We're going to burn your farms. We're going to confiscate your property. And this is this is what they were doing uh, after, um, well, before the battle, but particularly more after the battle. Um, as Governor Livingston, um, Governor Livingston had this quote um, that uh, in Mammoth, uh, uh, William Livingston called it the theater of spoil and destruction. It was a really violent place during the war, and and Scudder and and Foreman were were two of the reasons for it. So then what happens, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna read you this. Um, so he's still in, he's still in Congress. And then, uh, oh, he writes uh, after, after the battle, he writes, great plunder and devastation have been committed among my friends in this quarter. This is him writing after the battle, but through the distinguishing goods of the province, my family and po property escaped almost a miraculous matter. It was so bad during this time that Adelberg estimates that something like half of all the families in the county were harmed, uh, their property or persons were harmed during during the revolution. Uh, that's how much uh, violence there was. So, so then, so this is this is from a, a contemporary account because uh, what happens on October seventeenth, seventeen eighty one? There, th these refugees or the the uh, the British. This is this is. I don't know if you can tell what this is. This is that's Seabright right there. See that. This is the Shrewsbury River. I'm sorry, the Navasink River coming up. Wait a minute. Yeah, the Navasink River coming up to meet the Shrewsbury River to go out into um, uh, Sandy Hook Bay. This is what's called Black Point Creek. All right, so what happens in Black Point Creek is that so the British, so the British party came off of here, went to Colts Neck, took six prisoners, right? And the alarm that now I'm reading uh, they marched, I'm going to read this account now. Under cover of night, marched undiscovered to Colts Neck, near 15 miles from the place of their landing, and when they took six of the inhabitants from their houses. The alarm reached the courthouse between four and five o'clock yesterday morning, when a small number of the inhabitants who were in the village of Freehold and its vicinity, accompanied by Dr. Nathaniel Scudder, when immediately in pursuit of them, hoping either to relieve their friends who had been stolen in cap captivity or to chastise the enemy for their temerity, they rode to Black Point, which I don't know precisely where it is, but this is Black Point Creek. This is along, this is around where the, um, oh, the municipal building in Rumson is along here. Uh, and that's, that's sort of a view of, of what it, um, what it looks like. Um, uh, they rode to Black Point, the place where the refugees had landed with all possible speed, fell in with, attacked the rear of the refugee party and drove them on board their boats in which skirmishing to the great grief of our party, Dr. Nathaniel Scudder, whilst he was bravely advancing on the enemy, received a wound from a musket ball passing through the head of which he instantly expired. Now, the other, another account of this says that he was standing next to General David Foreman, who was also on this um, uh, mission, uh, and Foreman stepped, and they were actually aiming at Foreman, and, and Foreman stepped back, and it hits, it hit, it hit, um, hit at Scudder instead. So, that's the end of Scudder. Three days later, what happens three days after this? 
the British center at Yorktown. Three days, he didn't see he didn't see the victory that he had been fighting for. This is his grave. It's on the slope leading up to Tenet Cemetery. Uh, if you're ever out there, go, go uh, pay him a visit. All right. So Scudder, that's Scudder. Now, what's the link here? All right. So that's you see how you got to get a more complex view of the revolution <clears throat> and of um, uh, of the revolution from from this one guy, right? Let me go back to this because there's something else I want to read you um, from this. This is uh, few. This is from the also the account of his of his death. Few men have fallen in this country who were so useful in life and so generally mourned in death. He was a tender husband, an affectionate parent, a sympathetic, generous, real friend, a disinterested, a determined patriot, and has, since the commencement of the war, devoted his time, his talents, and a large part of a comfortable estate to the service of his country, and what will add a luster to the whole, we trust he is a finished Christian. Thus has this great and good man fallen in the prime of life, and in the midst of his usefulness, having left behind him an inconsolable widow, five amiable children, and very numerous acquaintance to lament his fall. So he's buried a tenant. All right. So that's... A more complex view from the 18th century through one guy, through one local guy, born and raised here, left his left his medical practice to 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 fight for to fight for um, uh, to fight for um, uh, independence. There's, let me read something else. Uh, let me read something else. Scudder wrote. We suffer greatly in this part of the country due to the murder, depredation, and kidnappings of the refugees and disaffected. We have from the necessity, this is him, this is after the battle of Monmouth, this is him uh, arguing why the committee of retaliation is so important. We have from the necessity of our case on the sole ground of self-preservation been compelled to enter into a general association for the purpose of retaliation on the persons and the property of the notoriously disaff disaffected yet residing amongst us for all damages, depredations, burnings, kidnappings, etc., done or committed by any of the refugees upon the associators in this neighborhood, the refugees being the loyalists, associators being patriots. We, <clears throat> we amount to near or quite 500 and the number is daily increasing. We have chosen a committee of execution and have soundly pledged ourselves to defend us in the prosecution of business. An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. Pretty serious stuff. Uh, and, and let me let me just one more thing. We are well aware of the objections this distressing mode is liable to bring as being not agreeable to law, liable to abuse, and likely sometimes to injure the innocent. But alas, my dear friend, necessity has no law. We can no longer consent to be murdered and plundered by rule, while from the laxness and timidity and decision of our own magistrates. The law is rather a screen for the Tories, while legal protections afford but little security to the well-affected citizens. All right, so that's a more complex view of the revolution from a guy from Freehold, buried a tenant, educated at Princeton, memorialized at our borough hall in Scudder Hall. All right, so the link here, so now we're going to move to the 19th century. So in 1830, in 1830, this guy's name is William Dayton. All right, William Dayton. And in 18, he was born in Somerset County in Basking Ridge, also a Princeton graduate. Uh, and in 1830, when he's 23 years old, I mean, I'm sorry, eight, yeah, 1830, he was 27 years old. He moves to Freehold and sets up a law practice. And he is extraordinarily successful. He wins a, a big case that draws a lot of attention. And be, by 1837, he is in the Legislative Council, which is the same place where Scudder served. It was what became the State Senate. Uh, there were rep representatives from each, uh, from each um, county. So, in eight, so, so he doesn't live here for very long, but he makes his reputation here. Uh, and then he, um, so his legislative, by 1838, he was appointed New Jersey Supreme Court Justice. He was the he was only 31. He was the youngest yet. 1842, the U.S. Senate. He's appointed to the the senator dies. He's appointed to fill the unexpired seat. He is at 35, the youngest senator uh, in uh, the in the United States Senate. And this is so he serves in the Senate from 1842 to 1851. Okay. Gets more interesting as we go along. So these are the, so these are the these are some of the guys he serves. So that that's oh, that's the state house. Um, I'm sorry, 
that's that's the courthouse. That's so he comes to Freehold. He makes his name as a lawyer here in Freehold, uh, uh, work, you know, uh, uh, practicing in trials at the courthouse. That's the state house as it looked like before the civil. What it looked like before the Civil War, where he was a state senator and a New Jersey Supreme Court justice. Uh, and then these are the guys he serves. So he serves from 1842 to 1851, which is a really uh, well, not that I mean every time is, but there's a particularly uh, uh, influential time in the Senate. This is when, this is when Texas is annexed and we have a war with Mexico. This is when um, we have to settle the borders, the northern borders uh, with Canada of Canada with Great Britain. This is when we get California, New Mexico, Arizona. This is when slavery. Uh, we were arguing constantly about what to do with slavery and whether to expand it in the Western states, Western territories. And this is the Missouri Compromise. He was not an abolitionist, uh, but he was a uh, he he was an opponent of the expansion of slavery. So these so these are the guys he served with. So this is Daniel Webster, John Calhoun, Henry Clay, Stephen Douglas, Jefferson Davis, later president of the Confederacy. All right, so this guy is. Um, you know, making policy and debating policy with um, the people who shaped our nation. So in 1851, he leaves his law practice. Le I'm sorry, he left the Senate and goes back goes back to Trenton, lives on West State Street in Trenton, uh, and is uh, a lawyer again, prominent lawyer. Now, this is, this is a time of great political, you know, we're leading up to the Civil War here, and it's a time of great political turmoil. And he's a Whig, um, and the Whig party essentially dissolves in the mid 1850s. And so in, in the May of 1856, he speaks at a, what's called the Fusion Convention in Trenton. And this is, a, this is basically trying to come up with some sort of, um, uh, some sort of successor to the, to the Whig party, right? And so the Whig, so, so what's forming here is the Republican party. This is the beginning of the Republican Party, and the Republican Party back then was um, it, is quite different from the Republican Party uh, now. Uh, it was it was sort of a mixture of disaffected Whigs, abolitionists, anti-slavery Democrats, and nativists, uh, anti-immigrant nativists. And so he speaks at this convention, right? And he's he's promoting the Republican you know, what's turning out to be the Republican political movement, right? And so three weeks later, the first Republican convention, this is the first Republican political convention in American history is held on 8th and Locust Street in Philadelphia at this building called the Musical Fund Hall. Uh, it's still there, uh, but it's like, I believe it's condominium. I think it's still there and I think it's condominiums now, but it's like 810 Locust Street, 8th and Locust um, downtown. And so there's their meeting there three weeks later and they are, they have nominated John Fremont as their presidential candidate, right? John Fremont was uh, uh, Governor Cal was uh, uh, I apologize, Governor of California. He was, he was Senator from California, Western explorer. He was a really prominent guy, sort of controversial, perceived as kind of radical. Uh, and he's the first nominee of the, of the um, you know, first Republican National Convention musical fund hall, June, 1856, right? And uh, we gotta wait for Lincoln. Don't come, don't come in there yet, Abraham. So, they're, now they got to decide on who their vice presidential candidate is, right? So a delegate from Illinois nominates this guy. This is 1850. This is an 1856 portrait uh, photograph of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, so nominates him, 1856, right? A guy from Trent, delegate from Trenton, nominates Dayton. First ballot, Lincoln, 110 votes. Dayton, 258. Second ballot, Lincoln, 20 votes. Dayton, 529 votes. Dayton is the vice presidential nominee for the first Republican ticket. Lincoln was very gracious. This is what he, uh, this is what he uh, said to a friend. When you meet Judge Dayton, 
present my respects and tell him that I think him a far better man than I for the position he is in and that I shall support him and Colonel Fremont most cordially. They lose, right? We know James Buchanan wins uh, and uh, disastrous presidency that leads to the Civil War. Um, he was, thought, Dayton was thought to balance Fremont, Fremont uh, because he was perceived as more moderate and also he was from the east and he was from New Jersey, which is a neighboring state to Buchanan's Pennsylvania. It didn't really help. Um, he, oh, I'll wait for that. It didn't help uh, because uh, the Republicans lost New Jersey, uh, lost the presidential election in New Jersey, but they won the governorship, a guy by the name of William Newell. I should have gotten his picture too. So William Newell was from Allentown uh, and was a founder of the U.S. Life Savings. I think I got this right. U.S. I wasn't U.S. Life Saving Service, which became the Coast Guard. And Newell became governor, Republican governor of Jersey in 1857. So he makes Dayton uh, Attorney General. Right. Uh, Dayton doesn't want to be in the Senate again. He turns it down. So he 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 decides to be Attorney General, and then he gets involved. So, so see what we just saw here? We saw the beginning of a political party in America, the, the dissolution of another one, the run up to the Civil War, and we see it through the life of a guy who practiced on mainstream freehold. What he does next, this is really fascinating. Some of you may know about this, this case. This is a really big case, the James P. Donnelly uh, murder trial in 1857 in freehold, all right? Dayton is the prosecutor, is the attorney general who prosecutes the case. James F. Stonnelly was a medical student. Um, we could do a whole thing on this one. I'll, I'll keep it short. It was a medical, I think he was a medical student from a wealthy New York family. He was spending the summer at the Seaview Hotel in Atlantic Highlands. And a bartender by the name of Albert Moses ends up dead, uh, knifed and slashed in the throat. And quite a controversial trial because, and I, I, I didn't, that wasn't the point of my story. So I didn't, re, I mean, you could spend, uh, you could spend uh, a month reading all the trial transcripts and, and doing all the, 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 uh, uh, the byways of this one. But the basic thing is he proclaimed his innocence until he was executed. He was convicted. Uh, and it was, it turned into a big political um, uh, controversy because he was from a prominent Irish family. Now this is 1857, right? This is the rise of the know-nothings. This is the rise of the anti-immigrant party, the know-nothings. Newell, the governor, was a know-nothing. The Irish perceived his, because the evidence was circumstantial. It wasn't, there was no murder weapon. Um, there was no, it, it was really wasn't that convincing a case. And the Irish, and, and he was convicted by a Protestant judge and a Protestant jury. And this turned into a Protestant Catholic thing where the Irish perceive this as an assault on immigrants. So he's convicted. Newell uh, had the opportunity to commute his sentence from, from death to life in prison and chose not to, uh, and pointedly chose not to, and used that um, you know, to, to win votes among the know nothing crowd and later uh, backfired against him. So Donnelly in January of 1858, they hang him right downtown. I was, I was, I was having lunch with a friend at Sweet Lou's looking across the street at the spot where he was hanged from, yet where he was hanged, we, you know, next to where the, what's now the Hall of Records is. They built a gallows. He stood on the gallows for two hours and gave a soliloquy about his innocence and the injustice. He quoted Hamlet, and then he finally dropped. And wait for this, you know what that is? That's the hook that the rope was on and the MCHA has it. <laughs> they, <laughs> when I saw this, I said, wow, uh, uh, we're, really, we're really connecting everything here. The, the, the guy who made the hook, um, Bernadette, if she's on, can explain later how they ended up with it. But that's the hook, and they donated it to the MCHA. All right. So Dayton, back to Dayton. All right. So 1861, uh, well, 1860, he's put up for nomination for the presidency or the Republicans again, and um, he declines. He doesn't want anything to do with it. Uh, he's, you know, 
practicing law in 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 Trenton, and uh, Lincoln, of course, is the nominee. And Lincoln has this long inaugural journey, uh, circuitous journey that takes to takes him to Washington in 1861. And when he he comes across the ferry from New York, Jersey City, to get on a train, and this is and Dayton Dayton is the one who greets him. I welcome you to the hearts and homes of our citizen. There were 20,000 people inside the railroad depot that day. We have assembled to testify our appreciation of your character, our unwavering loyalty to the laws and the Constitution, and our devotion to the great interest of this country and the perpetuity of the Union. So it's a very warm relationship with, with, um, with Lincoln. So then what he does, he rides a train with them. They ride to Trenton. In Trenton, they get out of the train at the train station, and they take this carriage to the State House, where Lincoln gives a big address at the State House. So this carriage... You can go see this carriage. This doesn't belong to the MCHA. It belonged to James Buckalow, who was a leading citizen of Jamesburg. And this is now, well, at least it was recently. I, I hope it's still there. Uh, is in the Jamesburg, is in the Buckalow House, the Buckalow Mansion, in which is the home of the Jamesburg Historic Society. So that's the coach that was drawn by four Arabian steeds. Dayton sitting behind him, beside him, drove him from the train station to the state house and then back to the train station where he went on to Washington. All right, so. Lincoln get that's Lincoln, and he goes there to give his inaugural. You see, the Capitol wasn't wasn't they were still building the Capitol when Lincoln was inaugurated for the first time. All right, so now what happened? So Lincoln considers him for Secretary of State, but he ends up giving it to William Seward. So what he gives him instead is a position of there was the 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 position the ambassador didn't exist yet. It was called plenty potentiary. So he was in effect the ambassador to France, which was pretty significant because you know the Confederacy was trying to get France to come in on their side for a portion of the war, uh, and uh, you know to help them the way that the French helped the the Patriots in the um, in the Revolution. They did not, <coughs> they did not succeed, uh, and Dayton had a hand in that. Dayton was you know uh, helped keep the, the the French out of the war, uh, but then in 1864 he um, he goes to visit a friend at the Hotel de Louvre. And he has a stroke and dies. So he dies in the Hotel de Louvre in 1864. They bring him back here. They have a big funeral in Trenton. Uh, and this is, this is an account from the, uh, the State Gazette. Never in our experience has the death of any citizen of Trenton been so generally and seriously mourned as that of Mr. Dayton. Almost everyone appears to speak and to feel as he had lost a personal friend. He's buried in Riverview Cemetery. That's a cemetery if you're coming right, be, right over here. This is uh, 129 that goes up along of the river. That's Dayton's grave. Not too grand. His house got bulldozed to uh, for the state house annex. No more house. He's like Scudder. He's kind of forgotten. He, you know, the man who once beat Lincoln for the uh, vice presidential nominee is all but forgotten. There's a section of South Brunswick Township that's named for him because he helped get a school there. But that's basically it. The end of William Dayton. So we were in the Civil War here. So now we're going to transition. So you see what we learned from this one guy, right? Uh, not just the political maneuverings before the war, but then again, what happened during the war, the, the political maneuverings with France during the war, all right? So then we come to this. This is our Civil War link to the 20th century. And I hope Glenn Cashin is on today because Glenn Cashin was instrumental in this. Uh, this is uh, Thomas Fallon, Sergeant, who served in the... 37th New York Volunteer Infantry Regiment, but was from Freehold. Uh, and eight, this is this is an ancestor of of Glenn Cashin, who is you, if you go to the um, to the exhibit at the museum, you will see Glenn speaking in the video there, uh, and which makes him also a, 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 a corollary ancestor of of, of Bruce Springsteen, because because uh, Glenn is Bruce's cousin. So they were potato famine Irish. Uh, wait, that's in there. They were potato famine. So, so in 1861, Thomas Fallon had, had been was from Freehold, lived in a little house. We'll, we'll get to this. You'll see the connection. Uh, 1861, he had been in America for all of two years. He had been born in Galway, trained as a tailor in London, and then he did what a lot of Irish immigrants did when the Civil War broke out. He signed up to fight for his new country. So in 1869, two years in American, enlisted in the 37th New York Volunteer Infantry Regiment, the Irish Rifles. He served from the beginning of the war to the end of the war. 21 major battles. When his original two-year enlistment with the 37th ended, he signed up with the 35th New Jersey. 
And in his service record, you trace the geography and chronology of the entire war. First Bull Run, the Peninsula, Second Bull Run, Fredericksburg, Richmond, Chancellorsville, Chickahominy, Manassas, Vicksburg, Turkey Creek, Kennesaw Mountain, the Siege of Atlanta, Sherman's March to the Sea. Sherman's March to the Sea, by the way, shared the headlines in the New Jersey newspapers with the death of William Dayton. They were contemporaneous. Uh, of his last battle, Thomas Fallon wrote, I was up to the neck in water in the Savannah Canal. He was cited by Major General Philip Kearney for exceptional bravery at the Battle of Williamsburg. He was one of 10 men who advanced on the enemy in a skirmish line. Only four came back alive. He was further cited for several other actions. At the Battle of Fair Oaks, he left the sick list to join the fighting. At Richmond, he was dispatched as a spy to report on the movement of the Confederate artillery at Kirk Charles City Crossroads. At Big Shanty, Georgia, he led his company in a charge against the Confederate earthworks that took 29 prisoners. Fallon captured an enemy officer by hitting him on the rifle and dragging him away. That's, there we go. Uh, he was offered a 30-day furlough and gratitude. He declined. Now, the military award system was very different during the Civil War, and he received a Medal of Honor, but not until 1891. Uh, and he received it in a much less illustrious fashion than his grandnephew was, uh, well, and, and he received, arrived by mail from the War Department, his home at 16 Mechanic Street in Freehold. Now, he, before that, he had lived, now, well, let me finish this story. All right, so he's buried at St. Rose Cemetery, Medal of Honor recipient. That's the Medal of Honor. Now, this Medal of Honor, where was it? Uh, Muriel Smith, from the historical uh, County Historical Commission and, and Glenn teamed up and they found it at Dickinson College in Pennsylvania of all places because it had somehow perhaps not really sure ended up back in the possession of the army uh, and Dickinson College wanted a Medal of Honor to display because one of their graduates had earned one but they did not actually have it. So it ended up on display at Dickinson College, and for years, uh, um, uh, Muriel and, and Glenn led a campaign to bring it back to Friel. This is it. This is in the exhibit. If you go to uh, his hometown exhibit, this is there. Uh, there's, there's Glenn, Muriel, and Chris Smith. Congressman Chris Smith finally got it back for us and presented it to us, and it's now on display there. All right, so Thomas Fallon, all right, so... 19th century Civil War. He lived in a house right behind this beech tree here. That's where he lived. And you know who lived in that house for the first five years of his life? House is long gone. The beech tree sadly is gone too, but Bruce Springsteen. So you see the line that just traced here? Medal of Honor, Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> Same house, same house same house right so if you he uh, if you were lucky enough to see bruce um in live or if you even watched the the video of it um you know he talks about that house and he talks about this beech tree as formative in his experience so now we come to the most famous guy oh yeah to, that was the potato family that should have been there before it was right in the shadow of St. Rose of Lima, where the convent and the rectory and the, and the uh, church all are. That's where um, that's where the whole Springsteen, McNicholas, Cashin, uh, Zerilli clan lived. Right, right, all in those houses right around there. Um, that's the that's the cradle of the music that um, you know we all, well, most of us at least, I certainly do love. Um, so, what did we learn from Bruce? Now, he, he was not a participant in a great battle. He was not, uh, uh, he did not win independence for the nation, um, but he's told a lot of stories uh, about American history and about that were rooted in this place. This is what Freehold looked like in 1928. My house is right here. It's just built right there, right over there by the high school. That's the downtown right after the war. It was a potato farming region. You can read this, real fertile farms, which control the market of the United States. There were once 15,000 acres of potatoes in Monmouth County, 15,000 acres. When I, uh, uh, when I was working at the Earthbury Park Press, this was like on mid nineties sometime, I inter interviewed the last potato farmer, seven acres in Allentown, went from 15,000 none. Now, so all of these stories about 
um, if you listen to Bruce, if you listen to him speak in his Broadway show, if you listen, if you read his, his autobiography, if you listen to his songs, you hear all these stories about this town and how it fits into the larger story of America. It goes from an agricultural region to a factory town. Uh, actually, oh, this was, uh, this is um, where the old county yard was, where there's an assisted living place now over by Jersey Freeze. This was the Brakeley Pea and Canning Factory. I don't think it really was the largest in the world, but, you know, we'll, we'll credit local boosterism for that. Uh, and, but because there was so much, you know, they, they, they can uh, lima beans, asparagus, peas, green beans, all the stuff that was grown at the truck farms around here. But the primary crop was, um, there were also orchards, there were a lot of orchards, but the primary crop was potatoes. Right. That's an aerial shot of the town, the old A&M Caragusian rug mill, where Bruce's father worked not for very long, but he did work there. But where 1700, 1700 people did work, including uh, much of my family, uh, including uh, my grandfather worked there for 31 years. And when they left in in 1961, got exactly two weeks severance. So it left a bitter taste in the town, but it, it, it was an important place. So here's the story. Now, I'm just. I'm just going to concentrate on the stories that he told in the song My Hometown, which is essentially a documentary uh, of Freehold. Uh, and so here's the factory. Here's the t Actually, if you listen to the, uh, the Broadway show, he actually changes the lyrics. He doesn't call it the textile mill. Textile, he calls it the, he calls it the, um, uh, he calls it the rug mill because uh, that's what it was. There's a rug mill. That's inside the rug mill, the looms. I have Caragusian rugs in my house. And uh, if Nolan is on, Nolan just bought a house that had a nice big Caragusian rug uh, on it. Um, it was a segregated town. That's the Court Street School. Until 1947, when, because um, this plays into my hometown, and, until 1947, when the new New Jersey State Constitution outlawed segregation in education, uh, black students went to the, the Court Street School. The, that's this is the great Lily Ham Hendry who preserved that right there, uh, who preserved that building as a education and community center. Now, it became an integrated school. I don't know if um, Mark Hyman might be on tonight. He went to that school when it was an integrated school. Uh, the high school was integrated, though. It was always integrated. The first black graduate was in 1918, so it was you know it was a mixed uh, it was a mixed story, and this is the 1950s three Freehold High School football team, which was a short champion. This had the first all black backfield in the short conference. Quarterback, halfback, fullback, all. Um, uh, one of them was Danny Lewis, who went on to play at Wisconsin and in um, uh, the, for the Detroit Lions uh, uh, in, the, in the NFL. So baseball was very important, as we know from glory days. Uh, and this is, um, uh, Glenn Cashin's brother right here, Dave Cashin, uh, who was maybe the greatest player um, we uh, the town produced in the 30s, 40s. He played almost till he died, he played. That's him right there. Look at that stance. Looks just like Ted Williams, doesn't it? It's a beautiful, beautiful follow through. Uh, he was primarily a pitcher. Uh, yeah, well, he was known as a pitcher, but he was a great hitter as well. So there's some glory days. And, and Glenn, uh, maybe he'll do one of these one day. Glenn is doing a, a history of baseball in Freehold, as well as a family history. So along comes Bruce. And where does he take his first uh, publicity photo for the Castiles? This is, uh, this is Bruce right here. Uh, that's on the Battle of Monmouth Monument, right across, <laughs> not even across, barely across the street from the MCHA. That's that's where they took their first photo, the battle of um, at the Battle of Monmouth Monument, his first his, his first real day on the Castiles. Uh, so he played at um, the left foot, which was St. Peter's Church. St. Peter's Church wanted to keep the young people engaged, and they had a little teen club, and that's where uh, Bruce used to play. He played at the Hullabaloo. Those of a certain age might remember that on 25 Broad Street, which later became the headquarters of the Monmouth County Library before it moved out to Manalpin. Uh, so then it's so this racial tension it boils over in 1969 we, we you know we know that from my hometown he says 65 was actually 1969 it wasn't a Saturday night it was a Monday night uh, and nobody got killed but Danny Lewis's nephew the, the football player he lost his eye when a, when a car full of white kids fired a, a shotgun blast into a car full of black kids at the corner of Park Avenue and South Street uh, and we had a night of riots and we uh, I won't call them riots a night of broken glass a light of nobody got killed uh, and then it got, it was really bad here for quite a while. Um, 
uh, years of conflict you see on right stirred issues and freehold. So that that melting pot that well not a melting pot that conglomeration of races and ethnicities and classes uh, that freehold was all informed roots. Right. So he wasn't fighting the Civil War. He was fighting the independence, but he was telling the story of this town as a uh, as a as a story in miniature of the story of America. Right. So what are some of the other stories you see in Bruce's story? You, 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 stories you can tell. You can st tell the story of the rise of the Jersey Shore, the rise of the of the resorts, which all happened when the railroad at the late 19th century, when the railroad came down and one after another, the shore towns were founded. Uh, Asbury Park was the jewel. Uh, everyone had its own ethnic identity. Ocean Grove was the Methodist kept meeting. Uh, the um, uh, Bradley Beach was Jewish. Belmar was, as my father used to say, the one toilet Irish. And, and Spring Lake was, as he used to say, the two toilet Irish. Uh, and let's go. All right, so then Bruce, he plays in Asbury Park at the Upstage Club. He moves there. Um, and then what's another story he can tell? Tell a story about how the roads changed us. The, um, the, the parkway opened in 1957. Uh, the, this is pretty bucolic, isn't it? It, didn't, it doesn't really look like that now. Uh, that's more like what it looks like now. Uh, Turnpike opened in 1957. I'm sorry, Parkway 1951, Turnpike, tur Parkway 1957, Turnpike, Turnpike 1951, utterly transformed the state. He writes about racing. This is New Egypt Speedway. Uh, he writes about Atlantic City, the enduring appeal of Atlantic City. I love that shot. That's a, that's kind of an amount. That's a that's a cool shot of Atlantic City. Uh, he writes in and the transformation of farms into suburbs. Look at that. That's all that that greenery you saw in those earlier pictures are now covered over with houses. Um, he and this is Newark. So we, we go from this is Newark, 1967. This is Asbury, 1970, the year after Friel, 1970. And then we come to Vietnam. And I'm going to sort of wrap it up and do this. So this is this is Corp Lance Corporal Barton Haynes. Bart Haynes lived on uh, around the corner, not, not around the corner. He lived he lived on Center Street in a duplex house. One side of the house was the Hain was uh, was Bart's family. Uh, the other side was Tex and Marion Vineyard. And Tex and Marion Vineyard, if you know the Bruce story, if you've listened to it, they had no children of their own, and they took in. Uh, essentially, they became like surrogate parents and managers of the Castiles and of these all these young musicians and young musicians who practice there. Bart lived next door. Bart was the drummer for the Castiles. Uh, Bart enlisted in the Marines. Uh, didn't get to see anything of what the Cast, even let alone what Bruce did, or even what the Castiles did, uh, and was killed uh, Contry Pro Province in 1968. Uh, he was the first. I think he was the first. I think he was the first uh, guy from Field killed and killed in this in uh, in Vietnam, and so Bruce often talks about him when he um, uh, when he performs certain songs. And in 1996, uh, November of 1996, 96 was a big year in Friel. That was the year Bill Clinton came spoke here too. 1996, Bruce did a first time he came back to Friel to play since the Castiles, essentially, really. Uh, St. Rosa Lima uh, had bought the old YMCA building on Throckmorton Street and was converting it into a Hispanic community center. And Bruce did a benefit to raise money for it. It was during the uh, Ghost of Tom Joad uh, solo acoustic tour. It was just him, uh, uh, him and, and Patty, his wife, and uh, Susie Terrell, the violinist. And um, it was in the gym, in the gym of St. Rose. It was an extraordinary night. You had to be a freehold borough resident to go. Uh, excuse me, uh, this is a terrible thing. I'm alone here with the dog. I just have to pick her up and put her on the couch and I'll be right back. I'll keep talking if you can hear me while I pick the dog up. It's a little dog and you'll forgive me when you know why we have this little dog because she belonged to my cousin. My cousin loved this dog and after she died, we took her in. Uh, okay, so the dog is on the couch now. I live on Broadway in Freehold, which is a, an address that is actually in the township and the borough. And I had, to show, I had to show my license to prove that I lived in the borough to get my ticket for that. So at this concert, he started, he did a little story before it. He started talking about the markers on, at Elks Point in uh, at, 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 where, where Maine and Broadway intersect, um, 79 to 537 intersect downtown, which is our war memorial. And he said, I asked my mother, when we all went by us, what are they for? And she said, those are for the men from our town who died in the war. Now, it's not just the Second World War. Uh, it's, it goes back to, there's a, there's a cross there for Nathaniel Scudder. Uh, 
And that monument in the back is a monument that um, was built with the great efforts of Carl Steinberg. Uh, it's a World War II memorial that lists the name of everybody, at least everybody we could find, who served in the war from Freehold. Uh, Douglas Springsteen's name is on there. Uh, there's also a cross there for Bart Haynes. And so, so Bruce tells the story about asking his mother, what are they for? And she says, those are for the men from our town who died in the war. And then he said, this is, this is him talking before the, before the show. He said, this is for my Aunt Edie. And he didn't say anything else. Now his, and I'll tell you what happened. His Aunt Edie was married to Frank Bruno, who was not the last, but almost the last guy from Freehold killed in the war. He was killed in Okinawa. And he started playing this song, and I didn't recognize it at first. Now, he plays this song this way now, but back then I'd never heard it this way. It was a slashing acoustic version, and it was, it was born in the USA. It was born in the USA. And it was a, it was a beautiful moment that only, you had to know who Aunt Edie was. You had to know who Frank Bruno was, who had a son he never met, Francis Anthony Bruno, the son he never met. Uh, and um, to see that. And I saw her after, I saw Edie after the show and, and I said, did you know he was going to do that? And she said, no. And she just had tears coming down because it was such a beautiful moment that connected Bruce, not just to this place, but to all of history, all of American history. It was a really beautiful moment and it sort of summarizes the whole relationship there. And I love this picture of the band because, you know, he came from a town that had racial troubles and he had one of the rare integrated bands in rock and roll. And this picture just sort of captures what it was like in 1972 or three, you know, when they were young, they were hanging out. This is in Long Branch, I think. Young and everything was possible and blacks and whites could play in a band together and really summarizes what I think, uh, what, he, what I hope he got from this place. So I will stop there. That went a little long, that went longer than I expected. I apologize for that. I should have cut maybe a little bit of the revolutionary stuff, but there we are. Um, and um, I just want to read one more thing. This is something Scudder wrote to his son. Uh, three years before his death while serving in Congress in the year, he wrote to his son Joseph about, quote, a future of new promise, opportunity, and challenge for the brave new world. A scene is opening, my dear child, in this country for the greatest imaginable display of talents and education. And a young man with your capacity, abilities, and learning can't fail under God if he sets out right of making a figure in public life on the great public life on the great state of this new world. Indeed, I cannot help contemplate my sons as shining in, in future in some of the most splendid departments of this mighty rising American empire, the glory of the Western world. And I'll leave you with that. And uh, um, I don't know what we do now, uh, Dana, but oh, I okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was an amazing quote from Scudder. It's, he's like prophetic, right? It was, it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's the line from, from, from Nathaniel to William to Bruce, which was the point of tonight. And I hope I, made it, I hope I made it clear. Yes, so. you definitely did. You touched on so many things. It was great. Thank you. Uh, and is, I um, apologize for going long, um, but I'm glad to stay if anybody wants to stay and listen to questions. Ask okay. Questions. And uh, hold on one second. Let me I'm going to leave share. this photo up rather than looking at me. I think, oh. I think you'd rather look at this lovely photo than me. Okay. I, uh, you know what? I can actually, here, let me share my screen. Hold on. Let's go. I'm, I'm going to change it from you. Don't worry. Okay. Nobody panic. Hold on. Can I change it? Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to, um, before we get to the Q&A, remind everybody about our upcoming presentation by Mammoth Timeline editor, John Barrows, on July 15th. Um, he's an amazing storyteller, and he's a really great researcher. So, He's got some uh, three stories. One is Joshua Huddy, one, it, which is my all-time favorite. That's like my obsession. Um, he's going to do something on the wreckers of Monmouth County. And then he's also going to cover Thomas Edison, who spent time here in Monmouth County as well. So you don't want to miss that. Um, yeah, we can get going with some questions. I, first of all, that is not how I pictured David Foreman. I don't know how I went all this time without looking up an image of him, but... He looked that's like actually, Henry Knox. I think, I think that's a Peel portrait. I think that's a Charles Wilson Peel portrait. It looks like it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, does anybody have any questions? Let's see. Oops. Hold on. We're going to go back. I guess. Okay. So, we do have questions. 
Uh, was William Dayton related to Jonathan Dayton? I don't, uh, I, you know, I don't actually know. Uh, Jonathan Dayton, he, he, that's a good question. He, you can look it up as easy as I can. He, he may have been. He did have a distinguished Revolutionary War heritage, so he, he, he may well have been, yeah. Okay, and uh, Anne is asking, who was the last potato farmer in Allentown? Oh, I can't remember his name. <laughs> he was on Route 539. He was on Route 539 just outside of Allentown, and I can't remember his name. But I do remember that it was seven acres. Okay. Um, Joe is asking, he said, sorry to put you on the spot, but do you have a favorite Bruce song? Uh, favorite? Well, uh, well, I mean, I'm from Friel, so it has to be my hometown, sure. Mm -hmm. And I, Doreen's is Johnny 99, I think, right? Is that right? Oh, okay. I think so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so, uh, hmm. Let's see, and you know, I don't know if you know this, but Joe and I are interviewing people in Freehold. So yes, we did know. Federici. Yeah. So they, I want they, you to Yeah, Michael. That. Yeah, I know you did Federici's recently. You did Dana's. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 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 And the feet. Would you believe that um, Michael would not give me the pizza recipe? No, I'm, so I'm, was, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> I know. It's highly insulting that I didn't get that. Anyway, um, do we know when the last execution was at the courthouse? Was it no, Donnelly? You know, I don't know that. That's a really okay. good question. I, I don't know that. Uh, anybody else? Oh, it was Nathaniel Scudder. Hold on one second. Was we got a lot of questions coming in? Was Nathaniel Scudder related to the Scudders who were, who were medical missionaries out of New Brunswick? I don't know. Hmm. Can't answer that. I don't know. Yeah, there's so many people. I mean, everybody, and, and it's Scudders like everybody's interrelated. I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah, you know? the Scudders. They were a big clan. R Richard Scudder, who lived in Navasink, uh, and you know, was the publisher of the Newark, uh, Newark Evening News. Um, you know, there were there was when we were when we were dedicating that Burrow Hall thing, we were in touch with the Scudder Family Association, and they're all over the place. And somebody somebody did come from the Scudder family, but but you're that's a level of genealogy I just don't know. Yeah, yeah, it gets complicated. Um, Bill is asking, why do you think Bruce returned to Freehold after having such a complicated relationship with it as a child? Why do you stay with your family after having a complicated relationship with them as a child? Mm -hmm. um, because it's your home. And because mm -hmm. it's the source of your material. And, and I think every, I mean, I can't speak for him, but I, I mean, every artist needs raw material. And I mean, he has said this, um, you know, many times that he has he's, he, or made a decision early in his career that this was what he was going to write about. You know, the people he grew up with, the people he lived among. Um, so I would, I, I can't speak for him, but that would be my guess. Mm -hmm. um, Deb is asking uh, if Bernadette could share the story of the Donnelly execution hook. She will. She, she's doing, um, Debbie, she's doing a presentation in October on sort of macabre and creepy, spooky things in our collection. was It's going to be awesome. I can't wait. Um, so she'll she'll share it with you then. Or you could just ask her when you're in next week <laughs> and she'll tell you. Uh, let's see, what else? Hmm. Why and when did the original courthouse no longer exist as the courthouse? Go ahead, you could take that one, Kevin. Uh, well, it, it just, they needed something bigger. And so in the 1950s, they they built the, the new courthouse uh, up on, you know, where it is now on, on uh, between Monument Court Streets by the MCHA. Uh, and uh, it was just a question of size. Uh, so it was 1951, early 1950s. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly, but that's, it, it was just, it was just, you know, the county had gotten too big. They needed more space. Okay. Anybody else? We have any more questions for tonight? I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Well, good. But I'm glad to do it. Glad to do it. And I'm, okay. I'm, uh, and I hope you uh, think of those folks in a new light now. Definitely. I, I love when uh, I love hearing stories about Freehold because it kind of populates my imagination with all the characters. You know, I, I sort of see the streets like that now. Mm. Well, that, 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 you know, I'm, I'm the town historian. People ask me about houses a lot. And I'm, I'm just not that good on houses. I <laughs> I'm a, I'm a whole lot better on people. Yeah. <laughs> people are interested more than houses. I think so too. All right, sir. Thank okay. you so much. Very good. I'll talk to you. Okay. Thanks. Bye, Kevin. All right. See you. See you all later. Bye. Okay. Bye, everybody. Good night. Bye.